this week's lesson is on Gregor Mendel and heredity. And this, I know on Monday, you read the chapter and you did the highlighted words, which are most of these. We will go over these and most of the content that's in the worksheet as we go along. But the stuff I'm going to talk about in this lesson is stuff you should write down because it's the stuff you'll see on the quiz, it's the stuff you'll see on the unit test, and it's the most important of all the stuff. So first of all, Gregor Mendel. So Gregor Mendel was a priest, was a monk, um, and he was alive in the 1800s. So kind of for comp comparison, who remembers when was the first cell discovered? When were cells discovered? And when were um, when was cell theory? Take a look in notes. Cell theory, anyone remember? Cell theory, hook, nobody? Okay, guys, so the first cells, hook, hook discovered the first cells in the mid 1600s. Okay, so mid, you should probably write this down. I don't ask you to memorize a lot of notes, but just kind of for comparison for what else is going on in the world when Gregor Mendel is discovering these patterns in genetics. So Hook saw cells in the mid 1600s and cell theory wasn't until, what, a couple hundred years later, right? Um, and I don't remember off the top of my head. Did anyone find that one, cell theory? Well, it's a couple hundred years later, so it's probably going to be the 17 or 1800s. I want to say it's the 1800s. I'll look that up. But anyways, the point is, is that Gregor Mendel, as he is m discovering these really important principles of heredity, of inheritance, he didn't know, he may have known about cells, but he did not know about chromosomes or genes, and certainly not about DNA. DNA, the structure of DNA was discovered in the 1950s. But even before that, they knew that things were being passed down from generation to generation. So what Gregor Mendel was studying was just patterns in what he could visually see in these plants. Uh, you often see a picture of him. People are always like, oh, why is he wearing a dress? Well, he was a monk or a priest in a monastery. But the point that the, the fact that he was a priest and the fact that he also had a background as a science teacher, it led him to have the resources that he had to make these discoveries. So he tended the monastery gardens. Um, the monks, the priests, they lived in this monastery, and so there's this division of labor. So some people did the cooking, and other people tended, what he did was he tended the gardens and taught science. So he has this background of looking at the world around him and observing things, um, and then he had lots and lots of plants that he was cultivating and watching. Okay, He is known as the father of modern genetics, but we'll talk about the difference between heredity and genetics in a minute. Okay. Everybody have Gregor Mendel? All right. This screen is a little bit crazy here. But on this screen, um, it turns out, why did he use pea plants? Does anybody know? We've got these. I'll throw these all in the pile here. Anybody know why, why pea plants? I mean, it turns out that the fact that using pea plants allowed him to see things that you wouldn't be able to see, say, if he was trying to study genetics with dogs or chickens. Anybody know? What, what kind of things did he look at in the plants that he was observing? How tall they were? What else? OK, the seed pods, the shape of the seed pods. What else? The plant's position, so were the flowers like on the axis or straight? What else? Height, were they tall or were they short? Color the seed pods, color the seed, or color the seeds and color the flowers. So all of those things he observed. And what about, did he, con how did he decide which ones bred together? What would happen if he was trying to do genetics with dogs? Would that have worked? Why not? 
What's that? <laughs> then the dogs would move around. They certainly would be harder co to control in a lot of ways, right? <laughs> if you were looking at the traits of dogs, right, how long would it be until you knew what traits the puppies had? Also, however long it takes a dog to have a baby, right? I don't know if it's nine months. It's probably different than humans. But then how long till your next generation? Well, yeah, then you got to wait a couple of years till the dog's old enough to have babies. So it would be years and years before you could, could see things. How long does it take to, for a pea plant to go from a seed to a plant with seeds? Yeah, probably a couple months, right? But over the course of a summer, he could certainly see several generations, right? And he did these studies over many years. So um, why pea plants? There's a couple of different reasons uh, why studying pea plants ended up to be really useful. First of all, there was a lot of easily visible traits, right? And not only were these traits really visible, there was like one or the other. They were tall or they were short. They weren't in between. So um, no in between traits. They were tall or they were short. The flowers were purple or they were white. They weren't mixed in. And so that made it easy for him to see which trait was being passed on. And you can imagine in, in real life, in other things, they're not always that easy to see. Um, and then pea plants have a quick life cycle. They grow quickly so that over the course of a year or a summer, probably he couldn't grow them in the winter, he could see several different generations, which again with dogs or mammals of some sort, that'd be a problem. And then there is a third reason, which is that he could control he could control the pollination. Right? So this allows him to choose, okay, these two plants are going to be the parents. Do you remember how he did that? The textbook talks about it a little bit. How did you do that? Right, but how did he control which ones were breeding? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So he, so imagine, you guys all know what a lily looks like, right? Like an Easter lily or a tiger lily. So let's just draw, because that's an easy type of a plant to see. So it's got these big petals. And really all the petals do is attract pollinators. And then in the center is what turns out is the female part of the plant, right? And usually it's white or greenish. And then, and the seeds actually form down in here. You can't see that unless you cut it apart. But then there's these little parts on the side. And on lilies again, actually you can see them on tulips a lot of times too. Um, these produce pollen. So these will be bright yellow usually. And they make that annoying dusty pollen all over the place. Right? That makes sense? You've seen that before? So what happens is plants can either self-pollinate. So a flower generally has both the male and the female parts. The pollen can go here and down in the tube and fertilize the seeds. So then you know the genetics because both parents are the same, right? It basically recombined its own traits. Or you get a moth or a butterfly or a bee flying from flower to flower, and it takes the pollen from one flower to another flower. Well, what Mendel did is he controlled the pollination. So once the anthers, once these parts started producing pollen, you can either take a paintbrush and say, okay, this one pollinates with this one. And then you can actually just um, clip those off so that no other pollination happens. So in a few minutes when we talk about him pollinating plants and him crossing different plants, that's what he was doing. It's kind of a fine detail, but it's very important because if they're just randomly reproducing like they would in nature, he wouldn't have any control over what's going on. So the three reasons, and this will be a question you'll see on quizzes and tests, three reasons that pea plants were very useful. One is they don't have in-between traits. They're very observable traits that there's not in-betweens. Secondly, he could control the pollination. And thirdly, the pea plants have a very short life cycle.
they grow and reproduce quickly. All right, everybody got that? On these next couple slides, I believe I have, oh, these are just some pictures. And these are regular peas, these are sweet peas, so similar sorts of things. You can see um, what he was uh, looking at. And then here, and again, this is cut right out of the textbook, the traits he was looking at. We'll talk a minute about dominant recessive. But round or wrinkled, yellow or green, uh, the seed coat, smooth or pinched, green or yellow, side and end. And mainly what we'll talk about is the tall and the short. But the point was he had all this, this full set of really distinct traits that he was able to look at with the pea plants. All right, we're going to come back to that. Oh, and here, again, this is exactly cut straight from the textbook. You can see the parts. To prevent self-pollination, Mendel removed the pollen producing structures from a pink flower. He used a brush to remove the pollen from the white flower to another plant. And anyway, so you could see how he could control it. Straight from the textbook. No big deal. Oops, hang on. Now we're getting out of control here. Oops. So the vocabulary that you wrote down when you went over it on Monday, so I'll just go over these really quickly because you should have them already written down. These first three are also on the first page of your worksheet, heredity, genetics, and traits. So a trait is just simply a characteristic that gets passed down from parent to offspring, right? Like the color of the seed, hair color, eye color, all of that. Now, heredity is the passing of traits from one generation to another inheriting something. It's the same kind of word, inheriting. And this is really, literally what Mendel studied was inheritance. He didn't know about cells and chromosomes and DNA. Genetics, now the textbook definition I think is a, a little bit too simple. It's the scientific study of heredity, right? Well, what, how is that different than heredity? Well, it turns out that if you look at this, Part of the word genetics is the word gene. So genetics is literally um, much more high tech and you're literally studying genes and chromosomes. So Mendel is known as the father of modern genetics because of his study with looking at the plants and kind of hypothesizing what was happening, he was able to kind of pave the way for a more scientific study once scientists found out about chromosomes and genes. Does everybody have those words? Then the next set of words, really quickly, because again, I know you have them all written down, but we can't talk about Mendel's work unless you know these. A purebred, purebred simply means offspring um, of many generations all having the same traits. And Mendel, as he described these, he also called these true breeding because the same tall plants would always produce more tall plants. And something um, similar is like in dogs, you know, like a purebred German Shepherd. And they all look the same. They all have a similar set of genes because of very specific breeding and inbreeding to get those same traits. Okay, so that's, you know what that means. And then hybrid would be, to go with the dog analogy, like a mutt dog with different, um, very different genetic background. And if you breed two hybrid dogs, you don't know what the puppy's going to look like, right? Could have some random set of traits from the parents. Gene is, he called them factors that control a trait. <coughs> Last week we talked about DNA. DNA is made of genes, or excuse me, DNA makes up genes, and genes make up chromosomes. And we're going to continue to talk about this over the next like three weeks. But so when you look at a chromosome like this, on the chromosome, they often show it with like little stripes. Those stripes are sections that code for certain traits. So here you have a chromosome that's made up of genes. And each gene is whole huge amounts of DNA that makes that particular trait. When we watched the Bill Nye video last week on Thursday, 
Bill Nye mentioned the thing about his hair color, and he had like pages and pages and pages that was the DNA sequences for his hair color. All right, and then finally, this is a word that tends to be really tricky for people, allele. And allele, alleles are the different forms of a gene. So for example, you could have a blue allele, blue or brown eye color allele. In Gregor's Mendel's pea plants, there was tall and short alleles for height. Okay? And then the last two words really, and again, we'll get into a quick summary of what Mendel did, dominant allele and recessive allele. So there's allele again. And so dominant, easy to remember, right? The dominant one is the one that's in control, just like your everyday use of the word dominant. And so the dominant allele shows up more often, and it covers up the recessive allele. It's the one that's in control. And then the recessive allele is the opposite. It's hidden if the dominant allele is present. And then a hybrid, in this case, is going to have two different alleles, one dominant and one recessive. And a purebred would have two of the same allele. OK, so let's do a quick review of Mendel's experiment. So I recommend, I recommend drawing this because I think it makes more sense. But it's up to you. Either draw it or please follow along because this is where it all gets really important. And you guys kind of know how the story ends. Usually I tell this, I do this before you've done the worksheet. So it's a little more of a surprise ending. But Mendel, he's just gardening, and he's watching these pea plants, and probably many other pea plants, too, or many other kinds of plants. But these are the ones he chose to study. And here's what he found. Here's my incredibly beautiful picture of a tall pea plant. He found that when he crossed a tall pea plant with another tall pea plant, he got all tall pea plants. Right? Not a big deal. But this is kind of a control for his experiment. Right? So no big surprise. And then this is what he calls true breeding. Because the offspring always has the same traits as the parents. <clears throat> true breeding or purebred. And then the same thing happens with the short plants, right? He could take a short plant and another short plant, and you get all short. And these he called true breeding short plants. Again, no big surprise at all. Totally predictable. But then here's where it gets interesting. And because he had this data to say the short always make short and the tall always make tall, what he can do is then he takes, in another set of experiments, which maybe we'll do on another page. Oops. So then he takes a tall plant, a true breeding tall plant, and he crosses it with a true breeding short plant. And what does he get? Well, you know, you would think that he would get a medium. Isn't that the obvious answer, right? Or that maybe half of them were tall and half of them were short. But that's not what happened. What happens? He got all tall plants. Now, that's really weird. So he gets every single plant comes out a tall plant. Now, he thought this was very strange. And he there's actually pretty good documented records of all this data he took doing this. Because he said, well, I know that those short genes, those short factors, he called them factors, those short factors should be in there. Because I took the pollen from the short plant and put it on the flower of a tall plant. Or vice versa. I took the pollen of a tall plant and put it on the flower of a... Why is this not working? So then what he does, and we're going to call this the parent generation. P1, parent generation. And you don't really need to know this, but I throw this in there because they use these 
numbers to kind of keep things straight, and then you know what they mean. And they called this F1, which is the first filial generation or the first generation of children, of sons. So it's Latin. So parent generation, F1. So he takes two of these F1 plants. So they're tall, right? But these, we're not going to call them true breeding because it turns out they're not going to be true breeding. He takes two tall plants and crosses them because he thinks that those short factors, those short genes are in there somewhere. And what does he get? He gets some short plants and... Yep. On average, he gets three quarters tall and one quarter short. Tall, 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 short. Now that's weird, isn't it? And so he goes through a lot of um, experimentation of this. So what happens is after all this experimentation, the, he comes up with the terms dominant and recessive. And he says, well, I'm going to call the tall trait dominant, right? Because it's covering up that short trait. That short trait is in here somewhere, but we can't see it. And so then to kind of cut to the chase, here's how we do it now. If you have a true breeding plant for tallness, we're going to say it has two tall alleles, capital T. And we always use the letter that matches the dominant trait. So for height, it's going to be capital T. So capital T, capital T, and then the kids, they get one from mom, and one from dad, although of course in plants there's not really mom and the dad, but you get one from each parent, and the only thing they could possibly be is true breeding tall. And then for short, and this is weird, but for short where you're going to use lowercase t because it matches up with tall. So little t, little t, and again the only thing they could possibly have is little t, little t. Okay? So these are all purebred meaning that they have the same two alleles. Now, this is really cool because then when we go to this next generation, we can easily explain what's happening. So this guy was purebred tall. Big T, big T, right? And this one is purebred short. Little T, little T. So if these plants get one allele from dad and one allele from mom, what do they have? A big T and a little t, and that's the only choice they can have because they have to get a big T from this parent and a little t from this parent. But are they going to be tall or short? Tall because tall is dominant. Does that kind of make sense? Now here's where it gets really cool. So now these ones are both big T, little t, right? Big T, little t. So now each of these plants gets one allele from mom and the other one from dad. So they could get big T, big T. Oops, better make that the right way. Or they could get this big T and this little t, in, case, in which case they'd still be tall, right? Or they could get this little t and this big t, little t, big t, still going to be tall, right? Or they could get little t and little t. and it perfectly matches up with what he saw. Kind of make sense? So then, years later, a mathematician type guy, I think he was a mathematician, named Punnett, came up with a really easy way to figure this all out, to kind of map it out. Because if you have, it's probability, right? But if you have to keep making all these crosses and figure out which one's which, that's confusing. So he, 
let's see, there's our true breeding. Um, here, let's get rid of this one. We'll start fresh. So if we go back, so I want everybody to follow along with this because I don't think the textbook showed you this yet, did it? No? No. This is jumping ahead to what you're going to do next week. So this is a really easy way to figure out the probability. It works out really well because you just get two parents, and so you get one gene from each parent. So you have big T, big T crossed with little t, little t, right? This was the parent generation. And the way this works is this box gets one from here and one from here. And this box gets one from here and one from here, because this one goes down. All right? This box gets one from here. This box gets one from here. And then this one goes here and here. So what is the only choice for an offspring? Big T, little t. So you get 100% are tall that are carrying the, the recessive gene. Does that make sense? That was pretty obvious, though. Now, as we do it, so that's F1. So if we cross the F1, the two F1s, this is where this turns out really helpful because you say, now I'm going to cross a big T, little t with another big T, little t. Now what goes in this box? Big T and big T. And I'm color coding them so you can see which parent it's from. And in this box, you get little t. And we always put the big T first, just so it's not confusing, because big T, little t is the same thing as little t, big t. We just put the capital one first because it reminds you what goes. Now, what goes in this box? A little t and this big t. And then in this box? little t and little t. So big t, big t, is this one tall or short? Big t, little t, tall. Big t, little t, tall. And little t, little t, short. So that we get our three to one ratio. But this also shows right, that those three tall ones are not all exactly the same. One of them is purebred for the trait, these two are hybrid, and then short is purebred. Make sense? Yeah? All right. Now I'm going to give you one to do on your own so you can practice this. This is one of those crazy things like, I don't know, there's a lot of math things that are like this, I think. You can sit here and listen to me all day, and you're like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. But when you try it to try to do it for yourself, it's a little trickier. So I'm going to give you this next problem. I'm going to come around to each table group and make sure you get it. So now we are going to cross a big T, little t, so a hybrid tall, with a purebred short. So I'm going to put them here, and then you're going to do the cross. What goes on top here? Big T, little t. What goes on this side? Little t, little t. It doesn't matter which parent goes where. Just put one parent on each spot. Okay? So you need to do the cross and figure out what percentage chance would the offspring have of being tall or short. Okay, and after a quick walk around the classroom, every single one of you got this pretty quickly. You get one gene from mom. One gene from dad, one gene from mom, one from dad, one from mom, one from dad, one from mom, one from dad. What is the percentage chance you will be a short plant? So over the next weeks, we will do many of these. So if that was easy for you, that's good. 
what I did want to show you, Gregor Mendel, when he looked at his pea plants, get back to the right page, you can see in the textbook it had the, the possibilities, so, or the, uh, the numbers he got. And so they didn't come out exact, but that's what he used to figure these things out.